Good morning and welcome to the Cathedral of Our Lady of Victory as we celebrate the seventh Sunday in Ordinary Time. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My friends, let's prepare ourselves in these sacred mysteries. Let us call to mind our sins, and let us ask for God's pardon and peace. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, therefore I ask the Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me, O Lord our God. May the Almighty God have mercy on us, Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life.
and let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that always pondering spiritual things, we may carry out in both word and deed that which is pleasing to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. In those days, Samuel went down to the desert of Zip with 3,000 picked men of Israel to search for David in the desert of Zip. So David and Abishai went among Saul's soldiers by night and found Saul laying asleep within the barricade. With his spear thrust into the ground at his head and Abner and his men sleeping around him, Abishai whispered to David, God has delivered your enemy into your grasp this day. Let me nail him to the ground with one thrust, thrust of the spear. I will not need a second thrust. But David said to Abishai, do not harm him. For who can lay hands on the Lord's anointed and remain unpunished? So David took the spear and the water jug from their place at Saul's head, and they got away without anyone seeing or knowing or awakening. All remained asleep because the Lord had put them into a deep slumber. Going across to an opposite slope, David stood on a remote hilltop at a great distance from Abner, son of Ner, and the troops. He said, here is the king's spear. Let not an attendant, let an attendant come over to get it. The Lord will reward each man for his justice and faithfulness. Today, though the Lord delivered you into my grasp, I will not harm the Lord's anointed. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. But the spiritual was not first, rather the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, earthly, the second man from heaven. As was the elf earthly one, so also are the earthly. As it is in the heavenly one, so also are the heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly one, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, to you, who, to you who hear I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. To the person who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other one as well. And from the person who takes your cloak, do not withhold even your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from the one who takes what is yours, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. For if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend money to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even the sinners lend to sinners and get back the same amount. But rather, love your enemies and do good to them and lend expecting nothing back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Stop judging, and you will not be judged. Stop condemning, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and gifts will be given to you. A good measure, packed together, shaken down, and overflowing, will be poured into your lap. For the measure with which you measure 
will in return be measured out to you. The Gospel of the Lord. There is a very important and a deep spiritual lesson for us today in our first reading, the one from the prophet Samuel. Now, oftentimes I'm concerned that, it, that that reading is so obscure and the names are difficult to pronounce and the book of Samuel can sometimes be overwhelming to get, that we forget or we, over, we gloss over the lesson. It appears very simply in the gospel, and the, but it is important and crucial. So in case you're not quite caught up on how that book of Samuel outplays, let me give you the cliff note version, the small version of how that book works. So it starts with Israel, our ancestors in faith. They want a king. They want to be like all the other nations. And God tries to dissuade them. He says, you won't like it when it happens if I anoint a king over you. You'll be disappointed. He will take advantage of you and you'll, be, you'll, and you'll mistrust him and he'll mistrust you. But they insist and God's compassionate, merciful heart relents and he gives them a king. So he anoints the first king, and that is Saul. Now Saul, for the first part, at least of his reign, was fairly benevolent. But then what happens is he falls into that first sin, that original sin. He thinks himself God equal. And he thinks himself, I don't really have to do all the commands of God. And so he disobeys. And because he disobeys, he falls out of favor with God, which would be the end of it unless God then anoints a second king to rule Israel after Saul. That king is David, the greatest king Israel ever had. Now there there exists a tension between both kings, Saul and David. And that's that tension we see come full force today in our first reading. You see, at first it was an easy peace between the two of them, but then who knows what happens, maybe jealousy, maybe envy, maybe a struggle for power, maybe greed, only one of those other deadly sins that oftentimes plagues humanity, creeps its head and causes tension between Saul and David. So much so that it comes to the point, now they are mortal enemies. So much so as we see in our reading today, David is in pursuit of Saul. And now it would appear, as we hear in the reading today, that there is an opportunity here. Abishar, his right-hand man, has found Saul asleep with his own spear thrust at his head and his cloak. He runs to report it to David. He says, this is our moment. This is our opportunity. This is our chance. Just give me one shot at him. I will dispatch him. It all be over and you will be king. It seems like the perfect plan, except, except for David. David will not do it. He will not consent to the murder of the king. And it's the reason he gives that is our deep spiritual lesson for this Sunday and every Sunday. He simply says this, I cannot do it because he is God's anointed. It's just that simple. I cannot do it because he is God's anointed. Twice in the reading today, he makes reference to Saul as the anointed one of God. You see, it's to remind him and itself that even though I am his mortal enemy, even though we are at odds with each other, there is a certain dignity, a certain respect, a certain honor that has to be recognized because he is God's anointed. And once you have that anointed status, either as yourself or you see it in someone else, it demands something of you. It demands that you live life differently. Keep in mind, David himself was also the anointed one of God. We oftentimes forget that you and I, we share that same status. You and I, we are the anointed ones. Do you remember how we got that anointed status? It came to us from baptism. Even this morning, as the babies are to be baptized after mass, they will move into that anointed status, that chosen race of God. Parents and godparents presented us to her baptismal waters And as the water was poured over us, original sin was washed away. 
we were reconfigured to Christ and we took our place in God's body, the church. And then the priest, the deacon, got the chrism. The chrism oil signed us with that chrism on the top of our foreheads as priest and prophet and king, and we became the chosen ones of God. And now that life demands something of us. Now that life means we have to live a certain different way. Now that life means that we have a certain status and it calls us forth to deep, deep maturity. The question is then, what does it demand? What does it mean to be the anointed of God? What does it mean to be God's chosen race, his royal priesthood, his holy nation? What does this demand of us? And for that lesson, we need the gospel because the gospel will teach us. See, that lesson is contained in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus started teaching in Luke's Gospel last week. Blessed are you, blessed are you, but woe to you who don't get this right, who don't recognize your chosen status or the chosen status, the anointed status of those around you. See, the Gospel reminds us of what it means to come to full maturity in our faith. Now, have you ever heard of karma? Now, karma is an Eastern philosophy. Karma is the way many Eastern people kind of judge their lives and says this. It says, well, you know, whatever you put out there in the world is what you get back. So whatever you fling into the universe, the universe will have some way to boomerang it back to you. So if you put out love, then guess what? Love will return. If you put out peace, guess what? Love will return. But it also works the other way around. If you put out bitterness, or judgment, that what comes back to you. If you put out violence or hatred, that will also come back to you. It's karma, it's a philosophy. What Jesus does today is he takes that Sermon on the Mount and he uses that section that we have today and he baptizes, you might say, that Eastern philosophy and he makes it for us our theology. But not just our theology, he makes it for us a pattern of life. See, Jesus says it this way, He says, the measure with which you measure will in turn be measured back to you. This is not the universe working on us. This is us in harmony and communion with God. This is us knowing what it means to be the chosen ones and to follow that Messiah, the anointed one of God, so that we too can hook ourselves even more deeply into the life of Christ and therefore usher in with the Holy Spirit's guidance the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus says it this way. He says, if you love those who love you, what good is that? Even sinners do the same. But if you love your enemy, now that's something. That's what the chosen do. That's what the anointed of God do. And if you give money to those who you know can pay you back, what good is that? Sinners do that as well. But if you give to the poor and the needy, and the desperate. If you give to those who have no means, no possible means of ever paying you back or paying for your generosity, now that's something, because that's what the anointed of God do. If you're persecuted or or someone judges you falsely, if you were maligned or you're spoken about cruelly, if you respond with more violence to yourself, what good is that? That's just your basic human instinct. But if you turn the other cheek, now that's something. That is what the anointed of God do. You see, Jesus reminds us time and time again, we have to mature in our faith so we can come to the full status of God. And that's this invitation of the anointing that we get at our baptism. It's not lost on me yesterday here in the church our school students made First Holy Communion for the first time, 31 beautiful little souls to receive this Eucharist again for the first time. They were admitted to our table because they too were the chosen ones, the anointed of God. And they were come to receive that Eucharist so that Eucharist could again influence and, and infect their souls with that power to grow into full status. Their parents and their godparents were the first teachers of the ways of faith in those children. And those parents led them here by God's invitation to the altar. It is a unique and tremendous gift that God gives us when he gives us the Eucharist. It is so great and so broad and so deep that it can spur us on to that status as God's chosen people. And yet, that Eucharist is so small 
It will fit in the palm of our hand or rest securely on the tip of our tongue. You see, and this is our invitation today in the gospel, to come to full status as the chosen ones of God, to love our neighbor as God has loved us, not because we have to, but because we desire to, because like David, we can recognize even in our enemies their, their goodness and their image of God. St. Paul tells us in the gospel, in the second reading today, he says, we bear the mark of the earthly one, that first Adam, that first Eve. We also bear the mark of the divine one, Jesus Christ, who is the anointed one. You see, Jesus, if you translate that word from the gospel today, that first reading, what David calls Saul the anointed of God, he's calling him the Messiah. And if you want to translate that into Latin, the Christus, the Christ. And all of us then who bear that image Christian, we bear the image of the Messiah within us, the divine and the godly, made whole and made complete by the great goodness of God in his incarnation. And now we bear that mark. We bear that chosen status. And now we must do the work of God. We must love our neighbor as God has loved us. And together, let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father, the all I believe in the Lord Let us turn now to God, who marks us as his own. Let us offer him our needs. For the church, may we be a font of mercy to all people, approaching sinners with love and forgiveness, rather than judgment and condemnation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For those in public office, may they work for justice for the vulnerable, pursue equity for the dis disadvantaged, and advance policies that support the common good. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For the OLV school students making their first Holy Communion this weekend, may they experience God's loving and real presence in the Eucharist and be nourished to follow his way of peace and love in their lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For our catechumens and candidates, and for us all, May we accept the challenge to show love to all people and thus grow in the likeness of Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For the people of our parish and for all the faithful departed, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For the needs listed in our parish intention book and for those we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. O kind and merciful God, who hear us when we cry, answer now in our needs. We pray them through Christ our Lord. 
Amen.
And pray, friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we celebrate your mysteries, O Lord, with the observance that is your due, we humbly ask you that we offer you to the honor of your majesty, may prophets for salvation through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and ever to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty Eternal God. For you so love the world, that in your mercy you sent us as a Redeemer, to live like us in all things but sin, that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours, that by sinning we lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks, as in exaltation we acclaim. And all you have created rightly gives you praise. With you, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and you make them holy. And you never cease to gather people to yourself, so from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice and be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy of these gifts we have bought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing. He gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which we poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. As we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church in recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May make of us the eternal offering to you, so that we may attain an inheritance of your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the blessed Joseph, her spouse, the blessed apostles, the glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence rely for unfailing help. 
May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith your charity, your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope, and Brennan, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you gain for your own. Listen greatly to the prayers of this family whom you summon before you. Your compassion, O oh merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, who are pleasing to you their passing in this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And now at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father. Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may always be freed from sin and safe from all distress as we wait the blessed hope of the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sin, but in the faith of your church, and graciously grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called the Supper of the Lamb. Thank you. 
and let us pray. Grant we pray, Almighty God, that we always experience the effects of the salvation which is pledged to us by these mysteries through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God.